Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Hawkeye Nation, to another episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, your daily podcast covering your Iowa Hawkeyes on the Locked On Sports Network. As always, I am your host, Andrew Wade, and it is the day after the win over Kent State. So, of course, we are joined by LaShawn Daniels. LaShawn, how are you doing, buddy? Doing well. Doing well. You know, can't complain. You know, every time we get a Hawkeye win, it's always, always a good time. So, you know, happy to be here. I couldn't agree more, but I will be. I will admit, yesterday's win felt wrong. Like, it felt weird to me. I, I felt disappointed at the end of that. And I want you to talk me off the ledge there for a little bit here in a second. Before we get into that, though, I want to remind everyone that the Locked On Big Ten podcast is the best place to get all of your Big Ten news. There's simply no better place than the Locked On Big Ten podcast to get all the news on the Big Ten conference than with Nate Dickinson in the Locked On Big Ten podcast. Follow the Locked On Big Ten podcast on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast app. Okay, LaShawn, so Iowa beats Kent State 30-7. to And personally... I'm sitting there slightly upset. And when you look at the box score, Spencer Petras throws for over 200 yards, no interceptions, one touchdown. Tyler Goodson runs for 150 yards. We hold them to seven points. We have another turnover. We get a fumble, scoop, and score. And yet, I'm disappointed. Did you have any of that from yesterday, or are you just like, you know what, I'm happy for a win? You know, um, obviously I think – everyone can agree even the players and the coaches that you know they could have played better um you know there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of corrections that they'll make today over on film over in the building um about how they can be a lot better come you know next saturday but that being said football is a hard game and it's very hard to come across wins no matter who you're playing um because again i mean it's not as um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's as competitive as the NFL, but I mean, you're still um, competing every Saturday against quality football players. So wins are hard to come by. And there's a lot of good things I think that um, I will put on tape and that is very encouraging moving forward. And, you know, it's early in the season. Um, we're still, still trying to catch our stride, but, you know, I think we have a lot of things that, We've done extremely well over these past uh, few weeks, but there's also a lot of things that we can continue to improve on. And, um, you know, knowing that coaching staff, that they're just going to continue to get these guys better and more prepared each week as the season goes along. Absolutely, man. That That's what I wanted to get that perspective because I know well, – I, I knew I was wrong in the fact that I felt not happy about that game, right? There was a lot of good things. Iowa sacked the quarterback seven times. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's absurd. The defensive line was getting a ton of pressure. And I, I couldn't you know going into this game, Kent State's Kent State's offensive line was grading out well, but because they were doing a lot of quick passes, getting the ball out of Dustin Crumb's hands incredibly quick, so they weren't actually having them in pass protections very long. But in true pass protection sets, this Kent State offensive line has struggled, and Iowa made them pay. It was fun to watch that. But again, I just go back to the fact that people were still upset throughout the game. Why are we going so horizontal? Spencer Petras throws 36 passes, and we get 209 yards passing. That's the negative way of looking at it. I look at it, Spencer Petras almost completed 70% of his passes, and he looked a lot more comfortable in the pocket, I thought, today than he has the whole season. So let's start with Spencer Petras, uh, 25 of 36, 209 yards, one touchdown. A um, couple things I noticed, at least for Spencer. He's getting a bit more in a rhythm. It looked like he was trying to target his wide receivers a bit more. Um, ball placement is still a concern. But with Spencer, a lot of it comes down to his base and where how he's actually setting up. And if he is set up and make you know his whole body, like the, the the foundation of his body is ready to go, his ball is usually accurate. And when he's moving, when he's falling backwards, when he's trying to get away from the pass rush, the ball is typically not going to be in the right spot. This is not obviously he's not Patrick Mahomes, but it's a bit concerning seeing that he has to have basically the perfect setup to be able to make the throw. I wanted to get your thoughts on, on Spencer's performance. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought Spencer played well. I mean, again, when you're completing 25 of 36 passes, I mean, that's still good, right? I mean, I know it might not be quite as vertical 
as we would like and as vertical as I think the type of potential that we have. But I mean, all in all, I mean, I think he made pretty good decisions, right? Didn't turn over the football, which is another huge thing. Um, and he was trying his, trying to get his playmakers the ball. I mean, we saw he targeted um, Tyrone Tracy a few times, obviously got the ball to uh, Laporta a lot. And then, you know, just trying to get the ball in the playmakers' hands, which I think is going to be um, very beneficial as the season goes on. And I think you're going to start getting more of that. But, I mean, all in all, I think Spencer does a great job. And when he does have a clean pocket and he doesn't have to move, right, that's where he really shines and, you know, can make pretty much all the throws, right? We know he's got a good, really good arm. Um, and you know that as long as he's comfortable in the pocket, he can read uh, the defense pretty well, find the open man, find the right matchup to get them the football. I um, love men. Yeah, I mean, the doing the offensive line obviously helped him out a lot to help him get in that rhythm. So as long as they continue to do that, um, you know, I think Spencer will be okay. And I think um, we'll be all right, uh, you know, having him back there. Absolutely. You mentioned getting the, the key targets involved. Tyrone Tracy Jr., seven targets in this game. Nico Regani, five targets in the ga- in this game, um, and a deep pass as well, which is good to see them go deep a little bit, uh, at least once. Mm-hmm. Sam Laporta, mm-hmm. six targets in this game, comes down with six catches. He's had some troubles with drops in the past, so good to see them. Uh, good to see him kind of have a very consistent performance. You mentioned going deep, and, and I think in past years, I, I think a lot of this all comes down to PTSD almost. Iowa fans look at this offense and they just they think about the last 20 years. And that happens when you have a head coach there for over 20 years, right? You think of Spencer Petras last year and anything he does this year, if it is not exponentially better, then it's exactly the same as how he performed last year, which is unfortunate for Spencer. And then you look at this offensive passing attack and you think of the horizontal passing days where you know we're not really getting a lot of depth on our throws. Do you feel like this game was just a – an opportunity to get the playmakers involved and not really show or open up the offense as much for when we play the full Big Ten schedule. I mean, what are your thoughts there? From because you mentioned wanting to go deep a little more, and I think there's some opportunities there. But what are your thoughts there? Do you think they're holding some things back, or they're just saying, you know what, take care of the ball. We're going to win this game regardless, as long as you don't throw turn over the ball. Um, I definitely think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, I don't know the exact uh mindset of the coaches but you know i coach high school football and i know that we've kind of done something very similar before where it's like uh you know what as long as we take care of the football and um keep everything you know as long as we look good on the offensive side like we can kind of save this stuff for for later and i don't necessarily think that they're doing that but they're probably doing that right i mean you don't want to show too much especially when um you have those weapons and you can create um, a lot of different concepts to help um, attack defenses. Um, but that being said, I think that the coaching staff also wanted more playmakers to get involved um, just with the game. I think some of a lot of their base offense. I mean, we saw a lot of players get in yesterday. Um, and I mean, in pretty competitive spots during the game, right? Because, I mean, as the game was pretty decently close, like for most of it. Right. And I think that the coaching staff wants to get a lot of these other guys involved. Um, just kind of see what we have um, in a game time situation, because, again, it can be a lot different than what it is like in practice. So um, I definitely think it's a combination of a little bit of both. Um, and I think as the season goes on and then we get more comfortable with, you know, our offensive line, get more comfortable with our skill guys out wide and our skill guys in the backfield. Um, outside of Tyler, um, I think that's when, you know, Coach Brian and Coach um, KF will be able to start expanding um, the playbook a little bit more. Absolutely. I think it's worth noting we also have Colorado State up next. So we're going to be four games this season. We have two games, and clearly not against necessarily cupcake teams. Colorado State takes down Toledo. Toledo, a team that took Notre Dame to the wire. Now, these are not. this is not transitive properties because one team beats another team does not mean they can beat <laughs> Another team, but it's still worth noting they have some good, you know, opportunities in their in their you know repertoire. So they have Colorado State up next. That's a good opportunity for them to continue to refine these things. They get a Maryland team that is not the cream of the crop of the Big Ten. So there's still some time to work on these things. They're still installing and getting to that 100%. You mentioned the younger guys. I want to talk about Arlen Bruce. He got his first catch. People have been very excited about him. 
You also mentioned the younger guys, Gavin Williams, got in the game. I want to talk to you about whether or not that was more of getting the younger guys in time or more of a Ivory Kelly Martin, hold on to the dang ball, and we're going to put Gavin in for a little bit. Uh, so we're going to talk about all that here in a second. I do want to tell you all about Prize Picks. College Bowl Fanatics, have you heard about Prize Picks? Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. I love this, and I know you will too. Prize Picks is a leader in college sports daily fantasy. It offers more college football props than anyone in the world and offers all the star players of the Power Five, as well as mid major players you might not have even heard of. Prize Picks offers any prop you can think of from yardage to touchdowns, even interceptions thrown. All of your users that deposit and use our promo code will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. And we are still working on getting you that promo code. Again, you pick two to five players and an over under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. And it's just you versus the projected numbers. Prize Picks allows you mixed sports entries. You can take the over on LeBron and also the under on Mahomes in the same entry. That's how awesome Prize Picks is. So, again, use that award winning app on both the App Store and Google Play. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. Price Picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals. Don't hesitate. Check out PricePicks.com or go to your app store and download the app today. Price Picks is daily fantasy made easy. All right, LaShawn. So before we took a break, we were starting to talk about some of the younger guys. And I want to talk about Gavin Williams. Gavin has looked good when he's ran the ball. But I want to get thoughts. Did they put him in there because of Ivory Kelly Martin's fumble problems? Or do you think they put him in there just to get him some reps? And I also want to talk about Ivory's fumble problems. What do you think he needs to do to fix that? Um, yeah, so first we'll cover a uh, cover Gavin. I mean, I think he was going to get a good amount of reps yesterday, and regardless um of with Irie holding on to a football or not, I think he was going to get a pretty good amount of reps, but maybe not quite as early as it happened because again, you know, Irie fumbles. And you know, Guy Gavin's a, a good running back. I mean, he does a great job of reading the reading uh, the right reads um when he's back there. Um you know, a strong runner. Um, and obviously he was taking care of the football and he caught a pass uh yesterday um as well, right? So um you know I think he's he actually got very... three. He had three catches. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think he's gonna be a very, you know, good asset to have, you know, to your to um the offense. Um just having another having another quality back in the backfield is going to be very helpful. Um which I mean uh Obviously, I think a lot of fans would probably like to have just Tyler in there the entire game, which, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to. Um, but, you know, I don't know what the coaching staff is. I mean, they probably want to have other backs there that are ready, you know, just in case, right, someone else has to go in, right? So, um, you know, Gavin, Gavin does, a, does a great job, um, did a great job yesterday. Um, I think something that's going to be important for him is being able to um, continue to improve in the pass blocking um, part of the game because, again, oh, that is a huge part of, our offense um, at the University of Iowa, being able to pass protect and help keep the quarterback safe and, um, you know, make the right decisions while you're back there. And then now when we think about Ivory, um, yesterday was a frustrating day, a very frustrating day for him. And I know that. And um, honestly, like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, it almost seems like, like he's suffering from the yips where it's like, you know, he can't, um, like basically, like do some of the basic things because I mean, like he won the job, the starting job. What was that like three years ago? Um, yeah, he was a st- yeah. people forget he was a starting running back. Loses it to Makai Sargent, who then loses mm-hmm. it to Tyler Goodson, and Ivory Kelly Martin still here through all of that. He was a starting yeah. running back three years ago. Yeah, yeah, and then like when I think back, I'm like, I don't remember him having, you know, fumbling issues, um, uh, for the most part, and. Um, you know, when when I was watching him yesterday and I've been watching him all season, like, it's not like his ball security is terrible, right? I mean, it definitely could be a lot better, right? It could be up more and, or more secure. Um, obviously, it, there's times where he just gets hit on the football. Um, and, like, you know, there's a lot, a lot you can possibly really do with that. That being said, right, you know that ball security is job security. So, um I know with him being a senior, it's really frustrating to be this far in your career and having, you know, these issues. So I don't really know, you know, what to really tell him. I think a lot of it is just like, just go and like relax a little bit, right? I think, um, you know, when you tense up and you think too much about the football, um, that's where a lot of fumbles can happen um, because you're just so focused on holding on to the football that you kind of forget everything else. And then like when you get an opportunity in the game, 
you know, you're just so, so conscious about it that it makes fumbles happen, um, you know, more easy. So, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, I think the coaches will help him out as much as possible um, with helping him, you know, secure the ball throughout the next few weeks in um, practice. And then, you know, obviously he's going to continue. He's going to get more opportunities in the games. Um, but, you know, he's just got to, I think, relax a little bit and, you know, just try to have some fun fun with the game. Um, I think, you know, the fumble, these fumbling issues is probably kind of weighing on him now. Um, so he just needs to relax a little bit and, you know, just go out there and have fun, right? I mean, you, you've been playing football all your life, right? You've been carrying football all your life. Um, you know you're not a chronic fumbler, so, you know, try not to worry about it. Just focus on it in practice and, um, you know, go from there and think it'll be okay. So. Yeah, I mean, he's been a nice, not necessarily a change of pace back, but just another guy coming in who can bring some speed and agility to the offense. Uh, but as you said, three fumbles to this point, and there was a fourth. It wasn't a fumble, but against Iowa State, he hit the ground kind of hard, and the ball bounced yeah. out. Great, he was he was down, which is awesome. But uh, when you hit the ground, you need to still hold on to the ball. Just you need to be holding on the ball the entire yeah. time. So definitely something to watch as we go into Colorado State and even Maryland. Um, yep. Iowa doesn't want guys who are going to be risky with the football yeah. or have a, a possibility of putting the football on the ground because that could mm -hmm. hurt the momentum of the game. Look at what happened to Kent State. They fumbled the ball at the goal line. They were about to make that a one possession ball game and mm -hmm. they, they, the ball goes out and the game turns. Now we're up 37. We win the game. People don't, I mean, when you look at that score 37, that is not as uh, intuitive as to where the game was actually going when Kent State mm -hmm. was driving down the field. So definitely something to watch going forward. Um, the offensive line, you mentioned the fact that the offensive line, you know, continuing to get better. Kyler Schott gets back. Um, played mm -hmm. a couple, a couple staff. I think twenty four snaps to be to be exact. There, um, kind of rotating in with Justin Britt, rotating in with Cody Ince, and then also Connor Colby. Um, I wanted to get a thought from you. So Iowa likes to rotate in their offensive line quite a bit. I mean, they're changing their offensive line rotation almost every single series. Um, mm -hmm. This is just my ignorance from an Iowa football perspective. How are they making those decisions? on a series by series basis. And as a running back, how are they making those decisions of whether or not you go in or when you were there with Akron, when Akron went in or like, I just, what, how is that all happening? I feel like the way the game flow happens, that that's gotta be a quick turnaround. So what are they doing and how are they making the decisions so quickly? Yeah. So as far as offensive line goes, I still don't know how they come up with their madness on how they get uh, guys in there. Cause I'm thinking back, like even, to my freshman year back in 2013, they even, at least early in the season, um, they would rotate guys in quite a bit. Um, and I think it's just, uh, I mean, getting a feel of how different groups work with each other um, and the success, of, success that they have. Obviously, like these guys are really close um, in practice and, you know, really competitive. And I think that between, um, Coach KF, Coach Coach Brian, and the rest of the offensive staff, they're really trying to figure out, okay, what is our best offensive line rotation that we can keep in there consistently by the time, you know, late October and November comes along um, during the season. And they also want to make sure that, you know, their sixth and seventh guys are really up to speed and being able to be in that, be in the game and be able to be plugged in at a moment's notice. So um, I don't know what goes into those decisions on the offensive line, um, but uh, I know that they're just their main focus is probably figuring out okay, what group of guys can we get in here that can be very consistent on a play by play, series by series, and game by game basis. Um, so they're still trying, obviously, trying to work out the kinks because, as I mentioned last week, right, it can take some time with your offensive line in a game like situation to figure out, okay, these are the guys that we're going to rock with um, and these are the guys we're going to stick with. Because, right, I mean, in college football, like, you don't have a preseason, so you don't really get those true live reps. I mean, you will go through a couple scrimmages against the defense um, during fall camp, right, while scrimmages in the spring. Um, but it's a lot different when you go through a game plan and you're going against a team that you don't practice against all the time. So, and then when we think about the running backs, so um, – and I think, I mean, it's always been a RB running back by committee ever since I was there. Um, I mean, I was, when it was my freshman year, right, it was um, Mark Wiseman, Damon Bullock, 
you know, Jordan Kanziri, and it was uh, like that my my sophomore year as well in 2014. And then, you know, in 2015, when um, it was Jordan, um, myself, Akram, uh, Derek Mitchell, right? Um, you know, a lot of it goes to just kind of getting a feel of it and kind of who, who has the hot hand. That's kind of how we rocked with it, um, you know, back in 2015 and in 2016 with me and Akram. It was a lot of, you know, kind of who has the hot hand and these are the guys we're going to kind of rock with. Um, and then in 2016, it was... But it was also the hot hand, but it was also depending upon what play we, plays we called, which I think kind of translates all the time, right? If there's a certain play that we've been practicing um, that they wanted a certain guy in, right, that guy would go in, um, which was unfortunate because I did miss out on a lot of fun plays, but that's another discussion for another time. But that being said, um, you know, a lot of that decision ends up coming back to, you know, what we practice, um, you know, all the way throughout the week. Um, I'm trying to get your – best guys um, in the best situation to be successful for the team. And, you know, that that's kind of how the rotation works, um, you know, in a game, game-like situation. So uh, obviously the flow of the game can change, right? A run, run running back can get hot and just, you know, not come out the game, right? And, you know, they just kind of stay in or maybe, uh, you know, maybe not having as much success, maybe not reading or the holes as, as properly as you should or not making – you know, the right plays in the passing game. And so um, sometimes then we'll just have a nice, healthy rotation just to try to keep guys fresh um, as the game goes on. So Makes sense. Um, I do want to quickly talk a, a little bit about you and Akram's rotation because I have something that I thought was just really interesting, especially after your testing and, and kind of the uh, – the report on you coming into the NFL, which uh, I think goes back to the plays that you got called for you. But I do want to tell everyone about sweat block. Sweat block has been literally life changing for me. If you have issues with excessive sweating, you're picking out the different color shirts. You're always wearing black shirts or you're wearing hoodies like I am right now um, because you don't want to show your sweat stains. Sweat block is where it is at. Believe me, I know this is not life and death, there could be a lot worse problems in the world, and there are a lot worse problems, but there's nothing more embarrassing than getting up in front of a lot of people and sweating through your shirt. Right now, you can use sweat block antiperspirant wipes, and that is where it at, is at. Sweat block is stronger and more effective than most clinical antiperspirants. You simply apply it at night before bedtime, go to bed. The next morning, you wake up, wash, and go about your day without worrying about your sweat. Guaranteed. I know this sounds too good to be true. I've actually tried several products and sweat block is literally amazing. No more pitting out, no more picking my shirt based off of which one will hide sweat better. If you or someone you love or is dealing with this, you have to check out sweat block, get it today for 20% off at sweatblock.com with the promo code locked on or Amazon or CVS. And last week, LaShawn, I told you about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market today. It's a protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar. Nine delicious flavors, plenty of limited time offerings. These protein bars are absolutely amazing. I know you probably tried your fair share of protein bars, and you got to send me your address because I will send you an entire box. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I got to show you this. I have legitimately 60 of these boxes of Built Bars in my office Jeez. right now, <laughs> so I can send you whatever you'd like. They are absolutely delicious. White chocolate birthday cake with sprinkles is my favorite. But not only are these bars delicious, they're also good for you as well. Between 17 and 18 grams of protein, 130 to 140 calories, 4 to 5 grams of sugar, and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. Nine amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy. And they are the official protein bar of the USA track and field team. If it's good enough for them, it's probably good enough for us. So go to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your first order. Use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. All right, LaShawn, so before we took a break, you mentioned uh, that you wanted to get into the story another time, another time. I just I want to quickly touch on this, though, because when you were with Akram in 2016, you were getting a lot of the power carries, and Akram was getting a lot of basically anything that was requiring a running back to receive the ball or get some sort of speed involved into that. And you came out and tested, and I believe you ran a 4-5-40. Is that correct, or was it a little bit faster than that? Yeah. Four five and th- oh. yep. Yeah, and I think the concern also was, can he catch the ball out of the backfield, which you showed at your pro day that you could. Um, but I think a lot of that goes back to the play calling. And I personally thought, like, well, yeah, of course, LaShawn doesn't get the get the, the ball from the receiving perspective because they're giving it to Akram. Um, I think a lot of Iowa fans felt that way. It felt like you were the power back, but clearly you showed that there was a lot of other dynamics to your game. Um, was that frustrating for you at all? <laughs> Uh, so you don't yeah, have to answer that. I just, yeah, you know, no, no. I mean, obviously, yeah, it was definitely, 
uh, frustrating in a sense because I was like, man, like I got I always got to run between the tackles. Like I'm always <laughs> battering my head around these guys. Um, but you know, I knew like that was I was obviously where I had a big you know advantage um, in my skill set and it was um, going to help our team win. So I didn't complain. I never complained about it at all. I was just like, man, like I wish I could get me, you know, one of these plays, one of these fun plays um, and do them. But, you know, obviously we know that we both had a lot of different strengths. Um, mm-hmm. Akron was extremely good in the open field, um, very hard to tackle in the open field. And that's where, you know, he made a lot of his big plays. So, um, you know, I definitely understood it from from that standpoint, but it also made me feel like, like man, like I can, I can do some of this stuff too. Like, for example, we played – was in Miami of Ohio in 2016 and I took a toss for like 40 yards for a touchdown I wasn't even supposed to be in on that play um but it was already too late in the in the uh play clock and so they just they just like ah forget it he's already in there whatever let him do it (laughs) so I wasn't even supposed to be in on that play and like that was just like one example of you know plays that you know that were designed for that was designed for Akram to be in, um, to take advantage of, because obviously he had really good speed. I don't actually remember what he ran in his 40, though. I think I might actually have a You were time. faster. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I had a, actually had a faster time. Um, but I think his game his game speed was, 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 Definitely really, different. Good. was really good. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that was kind of the dynamic. I used to definitely be a little bit salty of it sometimes, but, you know, I, I got over it. It was like, whatever. Um, yeah. You know, I'll just have to try to, try to show – you know, the coaches at the next level that I can, you know, do some of those things. So. Absolutely. Um, so Tyler Goodson, I want to get to the defense, but Tyler Goodson did get, I love the play call. Uh, they, they looked like they were running to the right and then Spencer has turned around and flips it to the left and Tyler Goodson is wide open. Uh, you've clearly been in those situations before. What are you thinking when you get the ball and you're like, I have one guy to beat and it's touchdown time, baby. What are you thinking in those? Uh, that's a hundred meter sprint. And just go to the end zone. <laughs> uh, there's literally like nothing else, nothing else you think about. You're just like, okay, all right, how that's the fastest way I can get to the end zone, and let's make sure I don't get tackled from behind. So, um, those are like really the only two things that you focus on. And obviously, make sure you're like on a play like that where you catch a toss, that you catch the toss, right? Like, I mean, you can see it, like, but probably like just by the way that they were lined up, um, like pre snap, you're like, okay, this is gonna probably gonna be a pretty good play. Um, but then like, obviously like the entire defense just flowed, um, to the right side and he literally had no one to beat. I mean, heck, he was already practically even with that outside guy. And, you know, the same use always say, if we're even, I'm leaving. So, uh, all you're trying to think about in that situation is like, okay, what's the fastest way I can get to the end zone and let's make sure I don't get tackled from behind. So. I love it. Um, you mentioned, you said you knew that play was going to be good when they lined up. What what about that play made you realize that was going to be a good play? Because I look at the play, I'm like, cool, run another play, it's going to be great, probably run. And then all of a sudden they do, mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, that was awesome. Mm-hmm. I had no, mm-hmm. I was I was not expecting that coming. Like, it fooled me initially. So what what about that play made you think this is going to be a good one? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know what type of film that they saw um, um, on Kent State, you know, going into the week. But my guess is that when they lined up, in that um in their heavy formation um with this with you know the strength all the way to the to the right side heavy to the right side um i think that they must have seen that they that those can stay uh defenders have heavy flow extremely heavy flow to that side um and they probably actually uh saw a lot of that whether it was through the past weeks or even through last season they say hey whenever we're in this formation or whenever a team is lined up like this if they get a heavy flow and they with the ball being on that on that right hash um and knowing knowing iowa i mean they probably game plan like hey they don't run anything you know counter like that so we're just gonna um flow heavy to that because we know that's where they're gonna run they're probably running some type of power or some type of outside zone to that side and then so uh they probably saw that in film and said hey we're gonna take advantage of this um so we're gonna fake it to the fullback tyler you're just gonna catch the catch the pitch going to the opposite way and use your speed and go score a touchdown. That's probably all that they said. Um and I think Tyler says like post game, like he was like before the play even was snapped, he's like, Yeah, like this is gonna be a good one or something like that. And all he has to do, all I have to do is catch the ball and <laughs> make sure I don't fumble it and then, you know, make a play. So um yeah, this this based on their alignment and what they probably see throughout film, 
Um, that's just the offensive coaches taking advantage of it. And it was a great play call. It literally, the offensive line, literally they didn't have to block a single person because Kent State defenders basically got themselves blocked. So Yeah. Um, I, I think the beauty of that play, too, is that now that's on film and people have to be aware of it going forward. They can't just mm -hmm. crash down because they do have to worry about Tyler Goodson and his his speed and his athleticism to be able to get outside and, and take to the house. Um, another thing that people have to be worried about now is Torrey Taylor can throw the football. Um, <laughs> no, I gotta, I gotta talk. Tori Taylor had another phenomenal day. Um, barely missed a beautiful coffin corner punt that hit the pylon. Um, mm -hmm. that fake punt though, I love the idea and concept, right? I love the idea that Tori Taylor has an arm and we're going to trust him to do some of those things. Cause last year he was still figuring out what American football was. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of doing a fake punt was just not going to happen. Um, that's on tape now, which is probably the only positive we can say about that play because Iowa takes a delay of game and then they fake punt it. And I love Tori. Tori's a great guy. He's been on the show before, but he threw the ball and Sam Laporta was still six feet from the line or six yards from the line of scrimmage. I mean, from, uh, from the, the, the first down marker. I mean, that play was, there was no chance of success there. Um, is there anything else you can take away from that? I'm just curious. Why do you do that play in that situation? <laughs> honestly, I have no idea. I don't honestly don't know why they did it. I think they wanted to see it in a game, in, in a game situation. But uh, I don't understand why they took the delay a game for it. Maybe they figured right if they were closer that they were already gonna be ready for the for the fake anyway. Um, but when you bring the, I feel like when you bring the offense out. And you right, you don't get it, and then like you send the punt. Like I'm sure that the defensive coaches probably still like, hey, still be be aware of the fake, right? Like if they were willing to bring the offense, you know, out on fourth and uh, whatever it was, I think it was like fourth and one, fourth and two, um, to try to draw us off sides. That uh, you know they could they could be up to something, you know, with the pump fake. So lo and behold, pump fake comes comes up and. I, it wasn't a well-designed play because, like you said, he wasn't even close when he caught the <laughs> ball. Like, usually if you're going to run a fake and you're going to throw the ball, typically you're going to want the receiver to be past the line to gain <laughs> um, when you run a play. And Kent so State I, was all over it, too. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. I don't really have anything. I think they probably just wanted to see it on tape in a game situation, and they're probably going to throw that one out and come up with another one. <laughs> Big fun, Let's so. hope so. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was that was not ideal. Um, we've talked a lot about offense. Uh, it makes them think a lot of the concerns are on offense. You don't typically have as much concerns about defense. What was frustrating for me about this defense is that they have been so good this entire year, and I love Phil Parker's defense. We talked about it last week. It's very basic. It keeps everything in front of you. You do not let guys get past you. Kent State before this game had completed one pass over. 20 yards and they'd only completed like four passes over 10 yards. This was not a team that throws the ball deep. They were very much a very horizontal passing attack with Dustin Cromick quarterback. And yet we had three balls over 20 yards, two against Riley Moss. And it just felt, I mean, the, I got to ask you, I mean, the, the one play Riley Moss, he hit his guy and then released him behind him. And there was no safety help over top. But it also didn't look like he was expecting safety help over top because as soon as he pushed him, he started running with the guy, but he's already three yards behind him. Um, it sounds like Riley just had a bad game. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess I don't really know where I'm going this other than it's just frustrating to see that happen. You can't let those kind of mental breakdowns happen. And Riley especially, um, I, almost, I feel for the guy because what an up and down. Every time Iowa fans begin to love him and show him love, he has a game like that, and then Iowa fans immediately resort back to the PTSD of, here we go again, Riley Moss allowing big plays. Uh, I don't have a point of where I'm going with this other than just speaking words about Riley Moss. Do you have any thoughts on what happened there? Yeah. Um, obviously, Riley's a good player, all right? He's yeah. at this point in his career. He's made a lot of plays, so obviously he's not bad. That being said, I don't know what was going on yesterday. I think a lot of it was just, you know, I had a bad game, um, you know, a lot of mental lapses. I think I just don't think he was quite, you know, as locked in as he should be. And I think he now acknowledged that um, post game. Did, yep. Um, so, you know, I think it's just a bad game. Just kind of getting away from a lot of his fundamentals, getting away from his keys, 
which, you know, allowed big plays. And we know that that's something, you know, you can't have happen. Um, I think like when, like the most important thing, you know, on defense is obviously eliminating explosive plays and on offense creating them. Because I think like when you have more explosive plays than the other team, you win like 80 some odd percent of the time, right? So like that is obviously something that has to be corrected. It'll be corrected today in film. And, you know, I think, you know, Riley's going to come out next week more locked in, more focused on um, his assignment, focused on his keys um, to prevent that from happening. And I, and I don't know if, like, on some of those plays, the safety is supposed to be there or whatnot, but, um, you know, the way that Riley was covering a lot of those plays didn't seem like it. So I think he's just got to focus, focus back up, lock it back in this week and practice, take the corrections today, and then be ready to go, you know, next Saturday, and he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Like he's our guy, right? So like we, yeah. he's gonna be out there. So, um, you know, he he'll he'll figure it out, and you know we'll be better. We'll be better uh, next week. Yeah, I mean, I think people Iowa fans need to realize Riley Moss has had probably ninety percent, ninety five percent of his games have been very good, but it's the five mm-hmm. percent where they are really bad, and people mm-hmm. just focus on that five percent. And we need to maybe realize that you know people can ha- these are these are young adults. Uh, mm-hmm. You know they're. They're playing a Kent State team. We all went into that game thinking this should be an easy win. Um, yeah. Imagine, imagine a twenty-one-year-old or twenty-two-year-old college student as well. Like we're gonna have it. Mm-hmm. I've had two amazing games. This will be easy. They don't throw the ball deep. All of a sudden, they're going deep. But yeah, when I watched those plays again, I had to go back because like, did I miss something? And I looked and like, mm-hmm. there's no safety over there. And it's not like he pushed him off and just sat there waiting in his zone. He pushed him off, looked back, and just started sprinting. Like, oh shoot, <laughs> I was actually supposed yeah. to be covering him the whole time. I'm like. That was just such a bizarre sequence of, of a plays. They put in Terry Roberts. Terry Roberts showing Iowa what we have behind Riley Moss and Matt Hankins. Uh, obviously losing Matt Hankins and, and probably Riley Moss after the season is going to be a huge loss to the secondary. It's a huge loss to any secondary. But Terry mm-hmm. Roberts had a couple really good snaps, um, was really good in coverage. Our defensive line, now granted, Kent State's offensive line, not exactly an offensive line to write home about, right? Not exactly the best. There's a reason why they're doing so much misdirection and you know uh, misdirection and manipulation with the play calls and whatnot to get um, defensive lines kind of confused. But Iowa's mm-hmm. defensive line, seven sacks in this game. Did you notice anything about this defensive line? I do want to say one thing about snap counts, but I'll let you kind of go in to see if you've uh, noticed anything about that defensive line and how they're playing. No, I just think that they're um... – they were doing a great job yesterday creating pressure at every all different points of, of the game, right? Whether it was in the pass game or there's in the run game, they were doing a great job of getting off blocks and getting in the backfield, which was huge. And I obviously think that Coach Bell is doing an awesome job with those guys and getting them better each week. Because I think, you know, as you as we've seen kind of over the past few weeks, they've just getting better and better each week just like the offensive line has so um they just have to continue you know taking the coaching continue to go out there and competing you know each week and creating that pressure because again it's going to be even more helpful right as the season goes on that if they can create pressure you know especially with those guys that we have in that secondary it's going to open up more opportunities for us to create more turnovers which in turn will then help us win more football games so i think they're doing a great job um, now I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and get into your next thing, but they, I thought they did awesome. Yeah, uh, I just want to note that Dustin Crum had a, only a 2.6 seconds on the ball, which I think is always good. You want to get it to around like two seconds you can, two to 2.5 if you can to get some pressure on him. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of quarterbacks are going to get the ball out quick, so you want to make sure you're getting there. Uh, what I noticed mm-hmm. about the snap count was YA Black played a little bit, but Noah Shannon's snaps are actually about even with Logan Lee. Lucas Van Ness, um, even Herkett mm-hmm. before he got injured. So um, Iowa clearly still figuring out this defensive line rotation. We're three games in the season, and these snap counts have been all over the place from who's playing. And I think, and yes, Iowa did get some of the younger guys in toward the very tail end of that game, but that would mm-hmm. not impact the snap count as much to say we are playing equal snaps between these guys. So um, as Iowa's defensive line continues to improve, we're seeing a lot of interesting movements with playing time. Uh, Joe Evans played, I believe, eight snaps that first game, and he's played 30 to 35 snaps since and has several snaps or snacks in that in that time. So um, sacks. Wow, I said snaps, snacks, and then sacks. <laughs> Holy crap. Uh, several <laughs> several sacks in that time frame. So defensive line definitely getting um, 
getting some some work in. They're trying to figure out what is that right rotation, and we're going to continue to figure that out for Colorado State. Um, before we wrap up, what is the one thing you feel like Iowa needs to improve on going into Colorado State? Um, I think we, we touched on it a little bit, um, but I want to definitely see some more explosive plays out of the past game. I think a lot of, you know, <laughs> fans would like to see that, and I know the team would like to see that, and getting, you know, some of our receivers some of these um, deep shots down the field and taking advantage of it. Um, we did improve, I think, this week on putting together a couple of good drives there. I mean, we had the 20-play, you know, 95-yard drive um, at the end of the first half, which I talked about last week. I wanted to see some more yep. um, consistent drives and putting – um, drives together. That was perfect. That was exactly what I asked for. And then they put together the one when the Kansas State running back fumbled the football on the goal line, and then they went down the field and scored on, on that drive as well, um, putting together a lot of balanced offense, mixing in a lot of runs, missing in the passes. Um, that's what I wanted to see. So I think this week I want to see some more explosive, um, you know, passes um, out of our offense. Um, and then defensively, um, continue to improve on the defensive line side because I think that's the the better, the the more improvement that they get, um, you know, week to week and being able to create pressure and get tackles for a loss is only going to help out the linebackers in the secondary even more. Absolutely. You mentioned the explosive plays. And I think it's funny. You said 80% of the time, if you have more explosive plays, you're going to win. And Iowa does such a phenomenal job at eliminating explosive plays, which is great. So they're probably winning that battle most of the time, but it's not for it's not because the offense is putting up uh, six or seven explosive plays a game. So it would be really great mm -hmm. to see that happen a little bit more. And as you mentioned, Iowa clearly wants to do these things. They just haven't had the mm -hmm. opportunity to do so. Um, you also mentioned those sustained drives, a really fantastic third down conversion percentage. I thought Iowa did a much better job on third down in this game. Spencer Petras mm -hmm. played another clean game. Again, the, the mm -hmm. balls may not always be accurate. Uh, you might get pissed off about some of his deep throws. But overall, he's doing what it takes to win a football game. Iowa now goes into the Colorado State game 3-0, and still a top-10 ranked team. Uh, I think you know it's okay to be a little disappointed in some of the things you saw. But again, as you mentioned, very happy with overall the fact that this team is continuing to progress. We got a fantastic guard back. Our defensive line is figuring things out. Riley Moss had a wake-up game. Spencer Petras threw the ball 36 times and almost completed 70%. I mean, it's been a while since we've seen that. Uh, so a lot of good takeaways as well. Well, Sean, thank you for coming on again. Where can the folks find you at for more uh, awesome analysis, man? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to start getting more content up for you guys. <laughs> you can definitely follow me on Twitter. Um, it's just my username, you know, Sean Daniels Jr. Drop a follow. Um, and then you can follow me on Instagram uh, at Sean Daniels Jr. as well. And yeah, man, um, you know, looking forward to hearing from, from you fans and let me know if I'm doing a good job or a bad job as well. So. <laughs> awesome man love it people people enjoyed it we got some good youtube comments so far i mean the youtube channel is very fresh it is less than two weeks old but uh everyone seemed to really like your your analysis so really appreciate that iowa fans make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcast at we are free monday through friday we've got a free youtube show monday through friday as well giving you all the content you need tomorrow we're breaking down the analytics of this game talking about some more snap count stuff what did we notice about that game who was good in coverage we know who that was, who wasn't good or who was good in coverage. We also want to talk about that. All that stuff coming tomorrow. Have a fantastic weekend and a better week, Hawkeye Nation. We'll talk to you later, and let's go Hawks.